Hey, this is a Hakawadi production. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the men's room. Before we get started with today's eye opening, thought provoking conversation, I just want to remind you to show your support for this homegrown content by subscribing to the podcast. Just click subscribe. It's as simple as that. We've brought in a guest today who we hope can shed some light on the recent unprecedented demonstrations in Lebanon, what it all means, and what the aftermath might look like. Imad Salame is an associate professor of political science and international affairs, and also the director of the Institute for Social Justice and Conflict Resolution at the Lebanese American University in Lebanon. He's a regular commentator in the media and the author of a book called The Decline of Nation States After the Arab Spring, The Rise of Communitocracy. Well, welcome to the men's room, Professor. I'm very happy you're here to help us understand this all a bit better and wrap our minds around what this could mean for Lebanon and for its relationship with its political allies, of course. Thanks for having me, Nadia. I'm very happy to be with you in this very historic moment in Lebanon and to talk more about the protests and, you know, the situation unraveling on the ground. So let's get right into it. The Lebanese people have been protesting mostly peacefully over recent days, demanding the resignation of a corrupt and ineffective government that's basically failing at pretty much everything, let's be honest, from the economy to providing basic services like water and electricity and processing garbage and human waste. I mean, it's a long list of grievances. But yet there's this great sense of optimism on the streets, partly because uh, of the numbers. Mm -hmm. Some say up to two million people. Um, have yeah. taken part, and also because there's a sense of unity that's never been seen before that kind of obliterated all sectarian lines. Um, mm -hmm. That's what we've seen, which is unprecedented. But is it really possible to put aside all those sectarian differences considering the political system that's in place now? Mm -hmm. Well, first, absolutely what you said, Nadia. This is an unprecedented uh, protest happening in Lebanon. It never crossed confessional line the way it cross this time. Uh, the amount and intensity of the protest is immense. Uh, and we're seeing protesters uh, in different cities uh, uh, from different sectarian backgrounds, all ages, all socioeconomic uh, grounds. Uh, so it is a by, by itself, this protest is really a challenge to the existing corrupt a sectarian system that has been pretty much unable to provide any kind of services or any kind of hopes for emerging generation, for young people graduating from colleges, unable to find jobs. You know, the population is, is fed up. Not only that, not only is this sectarian system is unable to provide for its population, but it's on but worse. It has been uh, bringing them down economically, uh, building the uh, country debt to unprecedented rates, unable to pay interest on government loans, money borrowed from banks and locally and internationally. So. The government is by all means dysfunctional, and if you're uh, academic, you will look at some of the indicators of fragmented states in the world. Lebanon ranks extremely high on that level. Its state is so fragmented, it's about to become a failed state for nothing else other than its fragmented political elite that looks at the government as it is a, a wealth to grab and to be placed in a pocket of different confessional leadership rather than to be invested for the future of the country. So based on your answer, it's unlikely to see a government um the same government uh, move forward in a non-sectarian uh, way, based on your answer. But protesters have been demanding that the current Prime Minister, Saad Hariri, and the other members of parliament step down. Of course, that hasn't happened. And he's responded instead with this set of sweeping economic reforms following this 72-hour grace period, which he requested from the people mm -hmm. um, in order to appease them. The protesters are still out there in huge numbers, though. Obviously, uh, it wasn't enough. Why wasn't it enough? Well, first of all, thanks for Prime Minister Hariri for having done 
you know, this miracle uh, reform plan that, you know, no one knows why it took so long to come up with and to suggest that, you know, we could uh, have a 2020 budget without imposing taxes on uh, uh, average person. Why did it take so long? Why did it? Uh, wh why was it based on taxations when, uh, to begin with? So, by the fact that it took the government now seventy-two hours to come up with this plan, tells you that this government is not to be trusted. Because people have been waiting for a plan yeah, for I mean, thirty years. Yeah, I mean, why do you ne do you need that kind of protest to happen in order for you to do your job? Nothing but doing your job. So that tells you that the people now in the street cannot trust this government. Uh, the people in the street have given this government chances over and over over the years. Uh, for the uh, last three decades, the government has, instead of utilizing the wealth and the income and the revenues it generated either locally or from borrowing money from international and local organizations, and despite all the aids that came to Lebanon during different international meetings like Paris 1, Paris 2, Paris 3, and all the funds that came to Lebanon to support its positions hosting the, ref the Syrian refugees, all this money has disappeared. So there is no real reason for the protesters now to believe that this government will act on its plan and will really move the country toward a, a reform vision. Uh, furthermore, the fact that this government is made out of 11 political parties, primarily sectarian political parties to represent eight confessional groups now in the government, that tells you this is not a real national government. This is a government of confessional groups. And this is a problem because if you want to bring different parties into a government and, and each one of them thinking of the interests of its own community and its own confessional leadership, you're not thinking national. You're not helping the country moving forward. So unless, you know, this state, the way we know it since the Ta'if, is changed, it actually implement important articles of our Ta'if constitution, then uh, there is no hope for this government to perform or to move ahead with reforms. So just to reiterate, the Prime Minister has promised to cut the salaries of top officials in half as part of the new budget. Uh, the new budget will also eliminate the Ministry of Information and cut the budget of Ministry of Development and Construction by 70%. They've also promised uh, 70 million dollar or $170 million uh, in housing loans. This is a major area of concern for the Lebanese who, mm -hmm. are, uh, who are having difficulty investing in homes, buying homes. Most people can't afford it in part due to, the, to some very high interest rates. So obviously this this doesn't go uh, far enough. And um, so you're basically saying that this group of ministers would be unable to deliver on these promises and would be unable to uh, change the system if, if the system remains the same. But what if um, the prime minister and the ministers um, simply stepped down? What would be the biggest concern if that happened? Well, Nadia, just like you mentioned, you know, the, every time we have a prime minister making a statement or a minister trying to promise that there will be reforms, and then they highlight what they will be changing, it tell, it, this tells you that the level of corruption that exists in a government is so entrenched in, its, in, the, in the way it works. Why all of a sudden did we find out that we can cut the salaries of top officials to half? Why, I mean, why we didn't act on this before? Why is, do we have these councils like the Council of the South or the Council of Development? Uh, why are these councils are draw, drawing the entire budgets of the government? Every time we see these promises to change, it's like, you know, it's like self-incriminating about how much corruption there is in the government itself. So, you know, we are 
um, really confronting a government that is dysfunctional. And therefore, whether it exists or it doesn't exist, it wouldn't make a difference. So if indeed Prime Minister Hariri resigned today, at least it will give a hope, a hope of an alternative, a, ch a changing alternative that will perhaps bring in younger, more capable young people to uh, make difference or to, to try, you know, something different in managing a country that uh, the current government and the current establishment has failed over and over again. So at least resignation does not mean uh, like, you know, what's being said that we will go to chaos. No, that's not necessarily so. We have various constitutional mechanisms that govern the process of where government resign. It can be an acting government after its resignation for a period, short period of time. Uh, uh, the parliament will convene immediately after its resignation. Consultations with the president will take uh, place. And then we have you know, uh, a new prime minister nominated to form a government. Now, I know that means that the system may be reproducing itself because, you know, the, this entire establishment, whether parliamentarians or the president or the prime minister or the uh, speaker, they're all part of the establishment. And, you know, you, you shouldn't expect much changes that they will bring about. But at least... By the resignation and by the presence of the people in the streets, that will send them a message that whatever government, alternatively, that they have to think about, it will have to take into consideration and the participation of the people from the protest movement. Otherwise, the same problem will, will reoccur. Right. So you don't seem to be concerned that would be there would be a power vacuum, uh, as you might call it. You, you think that the mechanism is strong enough to kind of fill the gap. But then the concern is it's going to be the same people who are kind of uh, trying to hold the situation together. And you've been quoted, I think it was in an article in The Independent during the Lebanese elections last year, as saying that like almost every law on the books in Lebanon, the way it looks on paper is very different to how it is applied or fairly administered in practice. Are you concerned? Obviously, you are. That that all these new proposals um, that they're proposing will certainly not be implemented as promised. And have they promised some of these things before? Mm -hmm. And do the Lebanese people trust their government to do what they're, they say they're going to do? You know, the, there is a, uh, a trust broken. There is a confessional system in operation. Some of the laws that you mentioned are written on paper of how to transfer power in, in case of resignation from government. And there are customary practices that typically not written that take into consideration the constitutions of the uh, or, or the composition of the ministers and so forth. Uh, I think the system, the confessional system itself knows that it is in deep trouble. It is unable to bring out the country from its economic uh, problems. And therefore, even the confessional establishment now needs people to help out. I think it is across the line uh, and across different political parties. They do understand. Uh, Nadia, you also uh, I have to consider that the political elites nowadays of major sectarian groups have aged so much and they don't have alternatives. I mean, uh, the president is old enough to, you know, uh, and not having, you know, alternative leadership. I mean, uh, Minister Basile is there, but, you know, the popularity of Minister Basile is not that strong. Uh, minister, uh, uh, Speaker uh, of Parliament, Mr. Birri, is old enough. You know, these people have been in power for so many years. They have tried their methods over and over again. And there is a real concern by, by their own constituents that the maintaining business as usual will not help much and will only lead to uh, deeper problems. And therefore, 
they recognize that they need to build a new partnership and they need to bring in to the national fabric Mm -hmm. of Lebanese politics new blood, a blood that does not think only confessional, but think in terms of national interests. So there is a the, the there is a strong pressure on the existing political establishment to consider partnership now, and this movement has you know made this possible. And I think this is the next stage for Lebanon. To, uh, to attain. You make an excellent point. In fact, um, the leadership seems to be really out of touch with the rest of the world in terms of the way they govern uh, the country. It's really the old guard. They don't seem to be in step with what's going on, you know, in in Europe, uh, even in America, which some argue is even uh, behind mm-hmm. in terms of mm-hmm. many uh, on many issues, including environmental, uh, women's rights, of course, just basic public services, um, recycling, technology. Um, there really falling behind and and uh, not taking this country forward. Mm-hmm. So are you suggesting that maybe part of the answer to this would be to work with some kind of a uh, group of consultants or people from the business community or from the international community who would become part of the government and kind of pave the way in, in a more efficient and uh, positive mm-hmm. way? Because in the end of the day, everyone wins if the country moves forward. That would be really helpful if we could bring in, you know, uh, advisory boards to the various institutions that can have uh, an international background and dealing with different uh, issues uh, of different ministerial concerns. That would be really helpful. I do also believe that there are plenty of qualifications among Lebanese themselves Certainly. to govern, mm-hmm. to, to be part of the government, and especially among young people. There are plenty. The question is, how can you convince this political establishment that the young people can be much more effective than they are, and that a, a national vision is needed, and that some this is something that they cannot deliver themselves and they need to um, you know have new participants leading the government and trying to move the country forward you know nadia i want to tell you something else you know uh, the problem in lebanon nowadays is not just about the individuals I mean, some individuals in the government some confessional leadership may have uh, you know, uh, really positive views. They, I mean, I definitely think sometimes that Prime Minister Hariri had tried in various ways to move the country forward, but, you know, he was opposed in uh, different stages uh, by different political interests. You know, things like, and, you know, people like Hariri may be present here and there. However, the problem is not with the individuals. The problem is with the system itself. The fact that this is a, what we call in political science, consociational system. What is a consociational system? Lebanese is one of the oldest consociational systems in the world. It meant that every government, every political uh, entity of this system must uh, include uh, every confessional group in the system. Right. And that implied systematically that when we want to elect our representatives, members of parliament, they have to be divided along sectarian lines. You cannot elect anyone unless that person is uh, allocated to a particular sectarian group. And your, your particular se- uh, sectarian group. Yeah. If I'm, for example, Christian, I cannot vote for, you know... A no, you could vote across sectarian lines. Okay. Now with a new electoral law, they scrutinize it a Since bit. Since last so year. It, mm-hmm. it turned out to be like one vote, one person, one vote, which means every sectarian person will end up, you know, by, by the system, uh, voting on sectarian candidate as well. But the fact that we are electing sectarian 
individuals to represent sectarian communities into the confessional uh, system, uh, into parliament. And then a parliament producing a government that also has to be consociational, meaning that it has to represent all the political parties and in parliament. And as a consequence, we've been having these what so-called national governments that is that are inclusive to all the sectarian and political groups. And th therefore, when we uh, operate, the parliament is really the same thing as government and does not Pro, you know, it does not practice any oversight functions over the work of government. So the the corruption thrives as right. a consequence. There is no checks and balance in the government. And also the judiciary is pretty much under the Ministry of Justice. So the Ministry of Justice and, um, and uh, government pretty much is in control of the judiciary. So you have three branches of government executive, judicial, and legislative. They're made out of the same people, made out of the same political party, and therefore when they work, they do not check on one another. They, on the contrary, they cover up for corruption when corruption happens in one place or another. So as a consequence, uh, you know, we, we're having this what's so-called rampant corruption mm -hmm. deeply rooted in uh, basic functions of government. So I really want to hear what maybe your proposed solution might be, uh, what kind of system would maybe function better. I know you've written a book, maybe this applies in this case. But let's just uh, let's just go over the fact that the, obviously the reason, I mean, this is a question, the reason that they, they are reticent to change it is because of this rampant corruption. Obviously, they're enriching themselves tremendously um, with the way the system works. And it's so deep-rooted in, in in a country with a population of uh, six million people, it just seems like corruption is rampant. Almost everyone in this country feels that everyone can be bought, right? You can pay the guy who's collecting money for your electrical bill to make it lower. You can pay the guy at the port not to charge import taxes when you're bringing stuff in, when you know the right people. Uh, the cops downtown, when you go to downtown Beirut, are in cahoots with the valets. They don't let you park. It's not the law. It's the law of the jungle, basically. Uh, so can new laws and new leadership really, if you changed what's at the top, which obviously they're not ready to move anytime soon, but even if you did, would you be able then to change this whole mentality uh, that you know trickles down through all levels of society? I wish that could be, you know... Um possible in Lebanon, you know, like you mentioned uh, to begin with, that, you know, the corruption in Lebanon is is uh, is across, you know, different groups. And it uh, you could see it from the top and you could see it from the bottom. The reason being is that this country's economy is not a strong economy. And it, uh, the country doesn't have much resources. It's primarily a service uh, based. Um, and it also depends heavily on remittances brought from abroad. Uh, and these are not something that the Lebanese population itself is producing from within. You know, we're getting a lot of support from... From which countries, for example? You know, we're getting a lot of from the Gulf, from the United States. You know, I mean, the Lebanese diaspora is quite spread out around the world. Mm -hmm. And, it, uh, and it's very successful abroad, you know, contrary to, you know, our success uh, domestically. So uh, we receive uh, uh, approximately 17% annually uh, from uh, remittances. Uh, and that makes us, you know, the, the culture in the country pretty much dependent on uh, money brought in from abroad. But also... The economy of this country uh, it brings, uh, you know, uh, brings back or has a background being brought from the civil war. You know, in the civil war, there were so many militias, uh, a lot of illicit activities happening, uh, trafficking, money laundering, uh, you know, uh, wasta mm -hmm. uh, being utilized. And, you know, I must say we haven't, uh, been able successfully to get rid of the that background, the the war uh, mentality, mentality. Mm -hmm. and it is uh, quite spread out. And this is being emphasized by the fact that uh, the militias that fought the war 
uh, are really now in government. And therefore, when you look at the economy today, you find out that almost, almost half of our economy is informal economy. By that, I mean that, first of all, we have illegal border crossing, uh, very active in smuggling between Lebanon and Syria. And it ranges from fuel to arms to human trafficking, you name it. And there are networks organized on uh, doing this and connected. These networks are connected to the political leadership in, of the country. Uh, we have plenty of uh, smuggling operation in, in a port. You know, this is by government uh, records. I'm not, you know, uh, sure. uh, I'm not uh, placing Inventing con conspiracy facts. here. Mm -hmm. You know, the government recognizes and it's trying to limit all the kind of uh, smuggling operation happening in uh, a port or the airport. Um, uh, we have plenty of, at least you, you look at uh, Bikaa Valley now, it's have uh, cultivated by hashish, by drugs, you mm -hmm. know, and these drug cultivation is linked to uh, elaborate networks of smugglers and so forth. Um, we have a lot of uh, economy, employment uh, that is not formalized in a sense there are no taxation, there are, so our economy is mixed is formal as well as informal. And a political uh, establishment <clears throat> excuse me, is linked to both. And therefore, when we're talking about change in Lebanon, like, you know, going back to your original question, there is no easy solution. Uh, there, we cannot switch overnight from a half informal economy dependent heavily on foreign aids and remittances coming into the country, into a, uh, a society, an economy that is formalized, that is perfectly state-citizen relationship with checks and balances. The problems in, at our hands are too many and too heavy to hold. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we have to strategize. And I'm sure this emerging young generation in Lebanon joining those protests have recognized that the first step toward reform, toward change in this political process is to act as Lebanese, to be under one flag, not to be uh, fragmented along confessional lines. This is step number one. Step number two is to change our electoral system, to change, you know, the way this government has been operating for so many years. Can you be specific about um, how it should be changed in order to be more representative of the people that is not divided along sectarian lines and that ensures that we don't end up with the same the same old guard, which has proven itself to be completely ineffective? Well, Nadia, you know, we... We came out from a civil war, you know, we always go back, you know, I'm a, a civil war generation, you know, I, I spent my uh, young days uh, during the civil war. And one of the mitigation or, you know, the resolution to the war uh, was supposedly the Ta'if constitution. The Ta'if constitution recognized that the ill of Lebanese political system is the presence of confessionalism. And back then, in 1990, uh, it came out with the position that we must eradicate confessionalism from uh, Lebanese politics, and we should eventually, in, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, like the, the Constitution said, uh, the second parliament, first election of first parliament will be half Muslim, half Christians. Then a second parliament should be purely deconfessionalized. Right. And, and since then, we haven't had any act on our own constitution. So we need to, first of all, look... So, so sorry, they were planning on eradicating the, the, the whole... Yeah, yeah, Article 95. But it was just never done, is it's that what you're saying? never been implemented. But that was the plan. That's what, we, you know, you mm. mentioned at the beginning. Yeah. You know, we have laws 
uh, written on paper mm. but we don't act know. on them okay so you know the constitution tells us we have to deconfessionalize in order to really move to post conflict society right because initially it made sense because you wanted everyone to have equal representation in the government so when you're resolving a conflict perhaps this makes sense but then 30 years later um, it no longer makes sense because then you're kind of keeping the divides definitely it doesn't make sense any longer so you know how to do that you know I, I, also the Taif uh, agreement or constitution tells us that the president uh, along with the prime minister must form a committee a committee of scholars and experts to sit in study ways how to deconfessionalize a parliament, what kind of electoral system to establish, what kind of district to have in a country, and how to make it possible that the second parliament after the civil war will be totally deconfessionalized. So we have that, and but you know we never acted on that. So in that is now the time to do that? The time to call for this, you know, if... This is, you know, should be a major uh, demand for reform uh, that the president immediately convene a committee to sit and examine how to have the next election uh, being deconfessionalized. Definitely, because if you, by definition, if it's confession by the sectarian lines, it's not a democratic uh, government because the people don't have the liberty to choose, you know, whoever they want, and and it, you're not really giving equal opportunity to everyone. You're you're That's setting right. rules that are not democratic in some way. So this this is a, a you know I think a great and excellent point. Yeah, and you know we uh, in. My, you asked me about my book, uh, my book, The Decline of Nation States and the Rise of Communitocracy. I use this word communitocracy. Did you make up that word, by the way? Well, p- pretty much. Yeah. Okay. I haven't seen it in academia, uh, you know. Uh, so communitocracy is different than democracy. And Lebanon is a communitocracy. By that, it means that uh, we uh, we we are ruled by the will of the communities. But communities here in Lebanon are predominantly sectarian oriented, so it is the rule of the community, and is not necessarily the rule of the people, as democracy will suggest. Because uh, democracy means that we are all as individuals equal under the law. We, uh, regardless of our, you know, sectarian, religious, national, or gender affiliations, mm-hmm. and this is um, different. So we are really living under a communitocracy, not a democracy. To move to a, a democratic state, we need to remove all these uh, profiles that we are born with, and we live by, and we are destined in our lives to um, abide by the rules being, you know, uh, subject to a confession rather than citizen of a state. Uh, So we need to move to become citizens of a state. And doing that, well, we have it. Article 95 tells the president to convene a committee, this committee to look at how to deconfessionalize the country. Some of these uh, leaders today, including uh, Speaker Nabih Berri, has been calling for Lebanon, one electoral district, and deconfessionalized. So, okay, if you all agree, why do are you disagreeing on acting on them? You know, this is the issue of trust. These confessional leaders typically speak about one thing and promise one thing. And then when it comes to application, you know, then they have all kind of pretext to suggest that they cannot act on them. Now the time for it. You have no the excuses. Fact that, the fact that people are joining together and uh, it's the first time in Lebanese history where you don't see this divide among all these people. Um, they're all suffering equally and they've realized finally that whatever your religion, you know, if you're poor, you're poor. If you're in a bad situation, you're living in a bad situation, no matter what your confessional mm-hmm. group. And this became apparent. Let's re- just remember that all this started with this proposed WhatsApp tax that the government wanted to impose, which I believe may be illegal. Um, 
where they can get off, like uh, taking something that's, you know, internationally mm. uh, accepted as a, you know, s- certain kind of service. And suddenly this country decides they want to tax it and take a piece of it. Um, and, you know, six dollars a month, which what was approximately what it might add up to for most people. It's a lot of money. Uh, in Lebanon, uh, 1.5 million people, which is about um, a third of the population, live in poverty on about four dollars a day so if you think about six dollars that's a day and a half worth of whatever they earn if you think about it in terms of affording just enough food for their family does that mean they're going to go hungry for one day or maybe Mm -hmm. they're going to be able to buy one you know like six loaves of bread less per month when they're already you know hungry and i think that this is just uh, obviously was the straw that broke the camel's back um following all these irresponsible uh taxations and uh usage of money but it's also at the same time, brought people together mm-hmm. because those poor people are not all Muslim or all Christian or Druze. They're they're all over the country. Yeah, exactly like you're saying. You know, the economy unite, especially uh, when you're poor and you have you know the, you have no reason to be to disagree with your fellow uh, Lebanese because of their different sect. You know, you, you don't have a reason for that. You have reason to unite to uh, gain your uh, rights. Now, I want to go back to one issue because, you know, you brought up this how to move forward. Yes. And I mentioned Article 95. Yes. Do you know that Ta'if also, tell, you know, guide us? And, you know, all what we need, we're asking is to apply the Constitution. This is, should be a simple demand, you know. Um, the Ta'if recognizes that there are serious concerns of different confessional groups in the country because you know we live demography we are influenced and affected by our surroundings uh, you know specifically for instance in Lebanon the Christians are on a decline demographically and numerically sure. and there are you know serious concerns of you know de- declining power that comes along declining demography of communities mm-hmm. and you know to guard ourselves from these issues right. and to make sure that every community has a, a kind of a safeguard or kind of protection yes. uh, protected under the Lebanese system. The Ta'if told us, okay, let's do a bica- bicameral uh, uh, parliament. A what? A bicameral Bicameral. Yes, okay. bicameral, meaning that we just like in the United States, we have a House and we have a Senate. So, you know, it's in the Constitution. We didn't, you know, we, I'm not inventing anything here. The Constitution told us, okay, have the House to represent national interests of all the Lebanese across the sectarian compositions and make this is a, a strongly centralized to, you know, I think ahead on issues that crosses sectarian concerns. And for sectarian issues, here you go. You have a, a Senate. Okay, have a Senate. Uh, Senate made out of representatives of all sectarian groups. Whatever you have a sectarian issues emerging, you have community, uh, you know, fearing demographic uh, issues or, uh, you know, having feeling that they're not being uh, heard, of, you know, they're not being represented adequately and so forth. You know, you have this small council or a house or a uh, Senate that bring these issues and discuss them. And this way, you are accommodating sectarian and non-sectarian, uh, you know, interest in the country. But you make up a really good point because actually I think this is what a lot of people would be concerned about, which is uh, Hezbollah's arms. And how should a new government formed by civil society handle that sensitive issue um, if that were the case? And what would be the best way to approach drafting like a national defense strategy in your opinion? If you no, thought it's about getting this. too complicated. Is you it? Know, because, you know, the, but definitely, I mean, this is something that needs to be thought of. Uh, and it, it has no simple uh, answer, really. The fact that we have Israel on our border and Israel is a serious threat for Lebanon. Uh, 
uh, Hezbollah historically, you know, through different confrontation with Israel, proved that it is capable and it is very effective way mean to uh, defend Lebanon and protect our, ourselves. Now, of course, for so long, we, you know, civil society organizations have said, okay, as long as this weapons is targeting and standing against Israel, that's fine. Uh, but once it turns domestically against opponents, then it becomes an issue. And then and after we had, uh, you know, the uh, March 14 movements uh, uh, blaming or accusing Hezbollah over the various assassination, including um, the tr uh, International Tribunal, even uh, you know, uh, uh, hinting of Hezbollah responsibility of the assassination of Prime Minister Rafi Hariri, and then Hezbollah becoming involved in different regional disputes, being reflected negatively on the country economically, with the United States imposing sanctions. And all various Arab states, which is still going on, uh, so, full yeah, swing. So, so it, it is, you know, we are addressing here. We would start to address a regional issue. Hezbollah is part not only of a Lebanese problem, but uh, part of a regional, regional problem. Mm -hmm. You could do so much as civil society. You know, the more the mass of the protesters, the more the bigger. Uh, the, uh, and the stronger the solidarity among the population is to change the way system operate, meaning, you know, to start removing confessional mobilizations. Uh, the more you start thinking about establishing and believing and working for a civil state, a state where, you know, the there is... Uh, a government that provides for its own population, whether that means economic, whether that means cultural, or whether that means security. The more we, you know, build up this kind of culture and thinking within a population, uh, the more we will think about uh, strategies to defend Lebanon and strategies to um, accommodate regional concerns uh, within Lebanese politics without necessarily going into like confrontation with Hezbollah. This is a long term, requires various regional developments to happen. And but but by the meantime, civil society uh, should emphasize that nonviolence should emphasize peaceful ways to uh, to gain political offices, uh, must you know emphasize the importance and centrality of the state as a sole representative of the population on all levels. Once we start accomplishing this, building this culture, then you know Hezbollah eventually and its popular support will you know uh, come and be integrated. Sure. It seems that integrated. makes sense that if you wanted to untangle this whole um, kind of conflict between the different sects, between Hezbollah and all the other, if you wanted to um, solve this problem in an objective way, it would serve pe people well to remove this this uh, sectarianism mm -hmm. and, and to start from the perspective of only looking at it as a national issue. Right. Hezbollah is not odd in, in around us. Uh, since the Iranian Revolution, now I'm, I'm going here a bit uh, uh, regional because you the know the context is important. Lebanon is so dependent on its region, and so and we have to understand Hezbollah and we have to understand the region. Lebanon is part of this region, and it will change things as along with the changes happening in in, in the region. Like I mean, now we're learning from Tunisia. You know, and Tunisia and other countries are learning from us now by this current Lebanese protest. You know, we learn from each other. We move together and we are implicated by similar problems. Now, I mean, for the past three decades at least, and since the Iranian revolution and the Afghani war, there has been a rise of uh, political Islam throughout the region. 
And Hezbollah is only a part of that movement. You know, we have Hamas before, even, you know, a long time, uh, Hezbollah on the Sunni side, Hezbollah on the Shia side. We have various Salafist movement emerging in Egypt, in North Africa, you know, remember Algeria um, uh, in the 80s. We have uh, many groups emerging in Syria, you know, uh, Qaeda coming in, ISIS emerging. Yeah, and that, that you know, is, is mm -hmm. uh, political Islam, whether in its moderate, or its radical forms, whether it is in, you know, uh, ec uh, its extreme violent jihadi, uh, takfiri position, or uh, whether that is uh, want like, you know, uh, to uh, be part of a government rather than to overthrow the, or establish an Islamic state. Uh, political Islam has mushroomed for the past at least three decades. Uh, before that movement, uh, political Islam, there were mostly left national liberation movements, you know, very strong around uh, the region. Now, I think, I believe, we are taking a new turn. Religious, rel religious politics is on a decline. It has reached dead ends all over the place. And I... I, I am going to venture to say that what happened in Saudi Arabia with MBS, I think the Saudis recognized, you know, that political radical Islam and, sal you know, Salafism is not the way to go. And they have been changing. I mean, MBS now, you know, doing all these opening and Vision you know, 2030. Trying, tw Vision 2030, you know, bringing women to participate. Uh, Allowing them to drive. Youth, yeah. Whether you like it or not, whether you're pro Saudi or not. But right. the, the, my point here is the fact that uh, political Islam is not providing solutions. It is causing more problem divisions, well, not only between Sunni Shiite, but within the Shiite and without, within the Sunnis. So we need to look elsewhere, especially as our nations are confronting serious problems and challenges to be part of this globe. Uh, we have too many difficulties to confront, and these, these issues can only be uh, faced by a unified na nation that is capable by all its populations, by all its uh, social segments, uh, be part of, um, you know, fostering new perspectives. And I think what happened in Tunisia in elections where, you know, uh, Nahda did not win the presidency, it did not win the majority, it kind of uh, decline in power. Uh, I think right now in Lebanon, we are witnessing the emergence of a civil movement, non-religiously non affiliated. This is very important. Uh, and we, I'm, I, I think we will see more of this movement emerging in different countries in, in the region. And therefore, religious, radical religious groups, whether in Lebanon or elsewhere, I think they will... Uh, fade out eventually. Mm -hmm. It'll be interesting to see if this is really the start of a civil society and if Lebanon will be uh, one of the leaders in kind of uh, deflating this whole political Islam uh, uh, trends that, you know, mm. that have been spurting up everywhere. And if they'll be um, one of the leaders and, and setting kind of an example for some yeah. of the other countries in the region. It'll be interesting to, to watch. Well, Nadia, you know, I'm, I have many friends from all over the Middle East especially from Arab states, you know, they always call me, sending me messages and, you know, and uh, many of them are telling me, I, we wish we are with you. Your protest is so, your protest is so beautiful. This is really what we need in our own countries. Right. So, you know, wonder whether we will have a, uh, a snowball rolling now toward other countries with, you know, with greater emphasis on the importance of civil society and national institutions to be built in the countries without intimidations by elites or autocrats. So hopefully that will be the way forward for Lebanon and 
in the region as well. I hope that uh, the the politicians in question will seek the advice of uh, of capable people and uh, informed people like yourself in building uh, this kind of new uh, system that really would benefit everyone in the, in the picture. And uh, obviously, we're at a turning point. So there's really no no other way. It yeah. seems. No, I'm. Uh, you know, we need to think differently in this region and Lebanon as well. We can, you know, time is very expensive, is moving fast. We have to be up to that challenge. And hopefully this movement has just brought in an important attitude among the population for change. And it is on the right track, I hope. Exciting times. Yes. Thank you so much for joining us, Professor Salami. It's been an enlightening conversation. I've learned so much. All right. Thank you so much for having me here. I wish your program a continuous success. Thank you. All right. I hope you all enjoyed today's episode. Let us know if you have any questions or comments about this or anything else we've talked about in the men's room. We love hearing from you. Don't forget to subscribe to the men's room wherever you listen to podcasts. Your click is kind of like a vote. Every single one counts. Have a good one.